thank um, Tess and Jess and everyone at FIPS very much for making today happen. We want to do a, a great big thanks to Stephanie, um, to Yvette, and Gary um, for being here today. We're looking forward to this panel discussion. So thank you all again, and we'll do some introductions soon. I'm Sean, I'm pronouns they, them, along with Ellie and Chris. I'm a co-organizer of the Pittsburgh Beacon Society. And as Chris noted, we wanted to do a, a moment of silence just in the next few moments um, for any sentient beings um, affected by oppression, by bias, by hate, um, by all, all hard conditions. So if we can just take a moment of silence. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sean. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our speakers now. We have three great speakers. Uh, the first I'd like to introduce you to is Yvette Baker, who is a vegan writer. She is a Los Angeles-based writer, social critic, and an advocate for total liberation. Her work is aimed at exposing and critically analyzing social injustices through Afro-Indigenous lens. She advocates for animal liberation within a consistent anti-oppression framework with emphasis on Indigenous sovereignty, Black liberation, and exploring the relationships between humans, other animals, and ecosystems. So welcome, Yvette. Thank our you. Next, <laughs> yes. Uh, our next speaker is Stephanie Red Cross West. And a little bit about her. Inspiring and supporting vegans in business is all a part of day, a day's work for vegan mainstream founder and managing director Stephanie Red Cross West. Grounded in the simple idea that in order to build a pro-vegan world, we need a solid infrastructure of successful businesses and brands to ensure that an ethical lifestyle is accessible for everyone everywhere. Vegan Mainstream provides tools, training, and support for vegan professionals. With 15 years of small business and Fortune 500 marketing experience under her belt, in 2009, Stephanie began blazing her trail as a leader in the vegan business world. Since she has been working hard not only building vegan mainstream into the invaluable resource it has become for vegan entrepreneurs and business owners, but also collaborating with key organizations in the vegan movement, speaking at events like VegFest and conferences, writing for a variety of vegan magazines, and participating in vegan business forums. She is constantly looking for new ways to share her expertise and help motivate others wanting to forward veganism. Most recently, Stephanie has been using her experience with online course development to create innovative online ways to meet the expanding needs of the vegan business community, including on-demand courses and a free business support group. She has also been exploring podcasting, always enjoying the challenge of finding new ways to help vegans make their businesses more impactful via digital platforms. So welcome, Stephanie. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, everyone. And we'd also like to welcome Gary Brown, a musician and social justice and vegan advocate. Gary Brown is a vegan musician and a warrior for equality. Since the age of 12, Gary has been making music and in 1993 formed the band Bushmaster, featuring Gary Brown, a funky cool blues rock original music power trio based in the DC, MD and Pennsylvania area. They have released five self-produced albums. Gary writes all of the lyrics and most of the music and is in the process of creating new tunes while he waits until performing is safe again. Among their many performances, Bushmaster is thrilled to have participated at several vegan festivals, including Kelfest, and Acorns A Go Go, and several years at VegFest in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, the band's favorite annual event. From his own perspective, Gary's music tackles social topics amongst more traditional blues topics, including police profiling, inner city violence, environmental issues, current political strife, and veganism. After a gig in Greenbelt, Maryland in 2008, the band was invited to a neighborhood backyard event where he had an enlightening conversation over the bonfire with a local vegan advocate, Cam McQueen. She invited him and his wife, Trudy, to a vegan outreach event the following week where the movie Forks Over Knives was shown and discussed. Gary and Trudy were so intrigued that they have been vegan ever since. More information about Gary and his music can be found on his website, bushmasterblues.com. So welcome, Gary. So we'll go ahead and start with our questions. Um, and I'll go ahead and uh, lead the first two questions. Um, and so uh, if we want to go in a, a roundabout order, starting with Yvette, and then Stephanie, and then Gary. Um, so the first question is kind of an introductory question. Please describe your path to becoming vegan and what have been the most joyful parts of it? Thank you, Christopher. I'm Yvette, again, she, her, hers. Um, can everybody hear me okay? 
Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, so my vegan journey uh, began as uh, a plant-based journey, um, food first. Um, I have a background as a restaurant uh, restaurateur. So um, I was helping open a very bougie plant-based restaurant and sort of fell into eating all of the food all of the time and having a bunch of vegan colleagues and sort of getting uh, sucked in that way. And of course the joy has been uh, aligning um, everything I already believed in and putting that into motion and really understanding that um, non-humans should be included in all of uh, my social justice uh, efforts. For me, my journey really started back in college. I had this kind of awakening moment where I got a little bit sick. Um, I had been traveling around, being in different states, eating different places. Um, and I ended up being in the hospital because it sounded, it turns out that I had um, contracted um, E. coli. Um, and it was a kind of interesting experience because you're in school, you know, you don't know why you don't feel well. And next thing you know, you get that call from the CDC and they're like, wait a minute, where have you been? What's been going on? <laughs> and they're asking you all these questions. And I think what happened for me in that moment is I started to understand the food that we eat, the impact it's making, the items that we're consuming, how um, are my choices kind of impacting my health? I really hadn't thought too much about it. I think sometimes when we think about our food, when we think about some of the choices we make at times, you know, we just do it out of habit. We just get used to doing it and we continue doing it. And when that happened to me, it made me pay attention to, okay, do I really want to make sure that I'm paying attention to what I'm eating, um, the impact it's making on me? And then I started to say, well, wait a minute, what's about this, you know, vegetarian vegan thing? And I started hanging out with other um, vegans. And through that process, I feel like I got educated. I started to really understand the animal rights issues. I started to understand how my choices were impacting um, animals and our environment. And once I started to understand that, I could start to kind of unpack my own behavior and make changes. And I think that to the point of what's kind of the joyous part of that journey is how much I started to understand my behavior and how I could change my behavior. And even through just my simple change before I you know, started a business and started doing all this other jazz, but how like my individual choices could make a difference for animals, could make a difference um, in my health and could make a difference in their environment. For me, it was like a mix of both of the uh, previous speakers' perspectives. So um, I was always conscious of health and that kind of thing, but I didn't put it together how what you eat affects your health. And I also have always loved animals, but like a lot of people, I had a blind spot, you know, as far as loving animals, but still eating them. So for me, my uh, change as far as becoming a vegan, it happened rather abruptly. Um, one night after a gig, we had stopped by a, a party and um, met a wonderful person named Cam McQueen. And we were just having a conversation just about you know the world and about everybody's place in it. And the conversation came around to food and you know what did I like to eat? And I mentioned some things and she stopped me and told me like, you know, about being vegan. And at first it was, you know, I was just, I let it go in kind of one ear and didn't think about it much. Um, maybe a couple of weeks after that though, my curiosity just started growing and me and my wife started investigating. Um, we saw the film Forks Over Knives that had a huge impact. And then I started to realize that, you know, animals are sentient beings as well and they deserve all the love and respect that other beings, you know, deserve. And that began my vegan conversion. And it's been a wonderful, you know, I haven't regretted a moment of it. I've never felt better. I've never felt better about my relationship to the planet and the, you know, the everything else. I just, it just, it's a wonderful state of being. So that's, that's me. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, those are wonderful, uh, what wonderful stories and, and messages that I greatly appreciate. And, and we all do. Uh, the next question, is how does a vegan lifestyle relate to community wellness? So in my communities, it has been really relevant insofar as kind of reclaiming health 
Um, there's been, there's a lot of uh, pre preventable diseases and sickness relating to food. So living a vegan lifestyle for many people has, has gotten us healthy, has gotten us caring for one another. Um, you know, there's a lot of community care, a lot of cultures care uh, for one another through food. And finally, with a vegan lifestyle, you can kind of show the love by giving, but also giving health. Um, it also helps, um, you know, the vegan lifestyle sort of uh, combats environmental racism in a lot of ways as well. Um, you know, some animal agriculture, um, you know, facilities will be near uh, black and brown and poor facilities and causing all sorts of health issues, sort of reinforcing that, you know, we need a different style of eating, that we maybe need to advocate against those systems and those facilities can kind of help us, you know, build community, realize that it's a, it's a multifaceted issue with people and other animals. Um, and just decolonizing our diets in general, kind of coming back and, and reclaiming um, our, our relationship with that, which was mostly plants to begin with, and sort of removing a lot of the animal products that weren't initially in our diets that we've grown to love and call soul food and, and comfort food and sort of doing away with that as a form of love and community care. And I'd love to kind of add or maybe, um you know, start from where um, Yvette um, left off with the idea of how much the vegan lifestyle impacts our culture. You know, I think one thing that was even a realization for me myself, um, and even as I see more and more people um, take this journey, is that there's so much, there's so many decisions we make, there's so many practices that we have, there are things that we maintain because of culture. We maintain because of habits. Sometimes we maintain them almost, you know, unconsciously. We don't even know we're doing it. And what I think there's such an opportunity as many of us move forward is making sure we spend the time to unpack those things, making sure we spend the time to address those things and even have dialogue about it. Because there's a lot of challenges, even when I think of myself, you know, as an African American, when I start to unpack things at times, I felt like I was unpacking or leaving a piece of my culture behind or losing a piece of that as I wanted to move forward in veganism, as I wanted to move forward in compassion. And the idea is we have to have an opportunity and a space to talk about these things. We have to have a place to kind of sort through these ideas so that we don't feel like we're leaving things behind, but maybe instead we're starting to make sure we understand how this lifestyle really complements our culture, how this lifestyle can really come back to our communities and grow our communities, um, you know, make our communities healthier make our community stronger. And also we establish traditions, whether it's traditions like US cultural traditions, like Thanksgiving, or even condition, you know, cultural things like when I think of a cookout that I went to as a kid, and I think of what a cookout should be, being able to veganize that cookout so I can still participate, animals aren't being harmed. And at the same time, I can still hang out with family and friends and we still have that enjoyment and that bonding experience. And I think that's important for us to, to have that dialogue and that discussion and recognize it um, as we continue to all even evolve on our vegan journeys. And, and for myself, um, a big part of the, uh, what I do like in the music community is trying to raise awareness for people to go vegan because at a lot of blues festivals, there's, there's a big, it's very meat centric. So it's you know been my mission to try to go to those places and try to you know, raise people's consciousness about that. And then as far as the environment goes, it's just not sustainable. Animal, big animal agriculture is just not sustainable. We, the planet can't continue down that path. It's, it's doing irreparable harm, <clears throat> excuse me, to our planet. As a matter of fact, living here in Pennsylvania, where you have to drive past like pig farms and things of that nature, and you, know, you realize just the general unhealthiness. And, but then again, people love what they've been used to eating their whole life. Um, not realizing there's so many tasty alternatives, so many healthy alternatives. So as far as the impact of veganism on the environment and on people, it's a good thing. It's all pluses and no minuses. Culturally, especially with black, the black community, it's a little tricky because the first thing you get when you mention veganism to a lot of people is, what do you guys eat? You just eat salad and it's, 
you know, I love enlightening people to all the alternatives and letting them realize that, hey, you know, um, I even wrote a song recently called Peace Begins on Your Plate. So, you know, I just, you have to make people aware. And like I said, especially, it's a little harder with our the, the Black community because we've just been so used so long to making all of our stuff centered around animal products. And um, it's a little tough sometimes to get people to pay attention, but that's, I consider that, you know, a worthy mission and something I'm on. Thank you. Uh, Ellie has our next question. Thanks, Chris. Thanks everyone for your great answers. Um, so the next question is, uh, as a vegan who is a person of color, what assumptions and or biases have you experienced? And how have you used your strengths to navigate these challenges? Uh, that's a tough one for me, um, maybe because there's so many. Um, but um, I think predominantly um, it would be that just being a person of color, in my case in particular, black and indigenous, that that automatically means that we, I'm coming from a place of being progressive and being, um, you know, uh, leftist and which I am, but <laughs> um, there's a lot of inclusion of other voices just based off of skin color. A lot of assumptions that, um, you know, we're all doing the same things and sort of, you know, giving the mic to any of us and feeling like that represents all of us. Um, and especially to those who are, who are, maybe not doing the work and maybe not interested in doing the work. And so I feel like that kind of sets us all back. And I use my skills to sort of navigate that um, by specifically calling that out, actually. That's something that I talk about quite a bit about representation, tokenism, cosmetic diversity. Um, it's all not helpful. And um, I, I write about those things. So I use my writing to combat those issues. Think. What I've experienced is, um, you know, being at events and conferences and VegFest, you know, sometimes one of the things that I've always struggled with, even when I was transitioning myself and even um, now these days, or maybe I shouldn't say these days, but, you know, pre-2020, um, when I was sharing the stage with speakers, that sometimes the solutions, the suggestions, the encouragement that was provided to the audience and provided to individuals on how to go vegan, how to transition, um, you know, some of the challenges they may face to me did not include um, answers that would help multiple communities, that would help people who are going through different things. And therefore it felt like um, sometimes we were sticking to a script, we were sticking to a standard and that standard unfortunately excluded people. So therefore someone would come to an event like a veg fest and think they're going to get help and they'd walk away and realize they didn't get that help because there wasn't anyone really paying attention and realizing that we need not only speakers on the stage that are representing different communities and representing even the communities that that veg fest is either in or that veg fest is within driving distance of, but also that the discussions include things that people are experiencing and that are challenges in their communities. Um, and to me, that's just something that I really think that even in our communities, we continue to struggle with. Um, we've definitely seen some change um, in the last year, but I think there's still so much opportunity to make, to ensuring that we're not just talking about this is the way to go vegan. This is the way that you deal with family challenges if you're going vegan. This is the way to source your foods and products. Because when we get on stage and talk about going to a Whole Foods to get, you know, this chickpea miso, blah, 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 those things are not available in a lot of communities. Those things are not in, within reach. So we have to make sure when we get on stage, we give solutions that are within reach for everyone and within their palate too. So it's not just about um, you know, having the discussion about going vegan, but I really think we have to cater it to different audiences. We have to have discussions that are a lot broader um, and be willing to have some of those discussions, even if they're uncomfortable. Okay. And just to elaborate on, on that point a little further, um, a lot of what I find is, especially within the Black community, as far as uh, their willingness to accept or reject veganism, 
<clears throat> a lot of that is they, a lot of times there's, they don't realize that it's an intersectional thing, that veganism is health, it's good for all of us. And sometimes uh, people of color, yeah, they take this assumption, they're like, well, you know, we haven't been, you know, given justice yet in this society. So how can animals come before us? And it, there's a, the challenge is making people realize that it's an all intersectional thing. We all rise together, us and animals, we all rise or we all fall. Um, and, you know, I can't blame the black community sometimes for feeling like every other issue in the world is placed before our issues. And so the challenge that I've had and the, one of the joys I've had is making people of color aware and white people too, but making everyone aware that it's all intersectional, that everything is tied together. You know, it's we're, nobody's like looking at the welfare of animals at the exclusion of our community, but it's an intersectional thing. If we look at the welfare of animals at the same time, it benefits in all of us. So that's, you know, that's my whole thing is just trying to make people realize that being an animal advocate is, is not at the exclusion or expense of being an advocate for, you know, minorities and other disenfranchised groups. Like all, I see everything is working together, so. It makes total sense. Yeah, we appreciate everything everyone has shared so far, so thank you. Um, we transition to a related question now, and that is, what can white vegans and white um, leaders of vegan organizations do to be more inclusive culturally from your perspectives? And we want to say that we definitely, you know, as, as white folks and white leaders of vegan organizations, I'll have a lot of our own work to do. So we're not expecting, um, you know, people to do the work for us, but we're curious from your perspectives, what, what might be helpful going forward? Well, first and foremost, um, pass the mic. It's always said, but you know, really pass it, pass the um, pass the leadership at moments. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna curate a list, be it um, on Instagram or for uh, an in person event, a conference, you know, let um, let us curate our own lists of uh, diverse speakers, so you don't fall into the trap of picking based on um, cosmetic diversity, um, you know, um, non-white uh, board members would help. Um, there, there's always this sentiment of, you know, we're going to hold ourselves accountable, but then there's no one there to hold your, yourself accountable. There's no, there's no marginalized voice um, in the position that would be there to sort of inform or have an inside perspective. Um, so that's always uh, a thing I've noticed. And um, you know, just continuing to always cre credit and elevate um, where 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 due. Um, a lot of things, um, as I'm sure everyone aware in the vegan community, our stereotypes. A lot of um, our culture gets whitewashed. So um, you know, correcting these things and always pointing out um, you know origins of certain products and certain um, you know things that have been veganized, it's always really helpful and means a lot to those communities. So they don't kind of get bulldozed over and, and um, you know, discredited for their work. That's what I would say. I would talk about participation. Um, I think a lot of times that we try to, if you try to understand everything from the outside in, sometimes you don't get the full perspective, the full experience. Um, I use the example when I became vegan, I had to go to vegan meetups. I went to vegan activities. I went to um, events and activities so that I was around a group of people that I wanted to better understand their mission, their purpose, their activities. And I think it's really important for people to kind of step out of their comfort zone at times. And it may mean that you're the only person in the room that you're representing at that time, because I know what it's like when I'm the only black person in the room. Um, and yeah, that may mean you're a little uncomfortable. It means you're moving in a different circle, but sometimes you have to feel that, you have to know it. You can't just read it. And I think it's important that you're participating. I think it's important that you're looking at other local organizations in your community and seeing where you can collaborate, where you can support. Um, if you're in a leadership role, the question is, how do you bring something to the table um, for these organizations? Um, and to kind of echo 
Yvette's point where you can give credit, where you can pass the mic, where you understand that, hey, I have annual events, annual conferences, I have a magazine, I have this, what do, what am I actively doing to make sure that what's in my complete control, I can actually act on. I think a lot of times we think it's always about things outside of our control. And yes, it's important to move society, move groups and educate others. But I really think it's important at times for us to look at ourselves and especially if individuals who are maybe white leaders in our community, white um, individuals that are doing things, think about what can you do and how can your actions change because then you not only participate, you also show others that you're not just about the talk, you actually act on what you talk about. You actually do it and people can see it and it may even encourage other people to do it. So you're not always wagging your finger, you're more of a person that um, exhibits the behavior that you're trying to help others achieve. And I think the two pre previous speakers pretty much covered everything. I would just like to add and expound upon what they said um, so brilliantly and, art and was such, you know, so great and so articulate which is just to be inclusive, just to remember, you know, make your festivals, you know, more diverse, make your, be open to other viewpoints. Um, realize that, you know, other people bring something new to the table. Um, and that's just it. Like I said, I don't have, they both, you know, both the young ladies that spoke before me were so covered it so well. So I just, you know, expound upon that. Just remember to be inclusive. Just remember that, you know, we come from different cultures and different experiences and just be open to, you know, black input. Um, and like I said, again, at, at festivals and events, just make sure that the roster is diverse. And that's pretty much, that's all I, you know, can say about that. Cause like I said, I think it was covered beautifully. Thank you Thank all you for everyone. your really answers. Appreciate oh, sorry, go ahead. No, and I, I think we're saying the same thing. Um, <laughs> really appreciate it. Um, and Ellie will um, ask our, our last question for now. Thanks, Sean. Uh, so our uh, next question is a uh, fun one. Uh, what are some of your favorite vegan meals related to your family or your uh, and or broader cultural heritages? Well, um, I eat everything, but um, I grew up on Ethiopian food and um, that vegan, is, vegan food um, really lends itself well to being a, created Ethiopian. Ethiopian food has a lot of vegan options anyway. Um, so um, that is my favorite. Um, and of course there's soul food um, that is being veganized all over the place with jackfruit and such, and you know the baked beans without the without the ham marinating in there um, still accomplishes the same intensity of flavor. Um, mac and cheese. Um, hopefully, everybody has a good dairy-free cheese up their sleeve. Um, and what else is there? Mac and cheese. All the soul food. You know, I'm totally into soul food, Ethiopian food, and it's. Um, so e easily veganized. I love, love food too. So as we even talk about food, I'm probably getting hungry as we even, as I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> but I really enjoy like veganizing classics or favorites. Um, that's really one of my favorite things to do because it, like I said earlier, it reconnects the the experience. So, you know, I made pound cake with my aunts, you know what I mean, as a kid. So the idea is I want to veganize pound cake and I want that to become a staple in the family. So therefore it's not missing from the table. It's never gone anymore. The idea now it's it, the standard still remains, but we definitely have a vegan version of it around. Um, and then I love to take dishes. Like I'm a big potato salad person oh, and some vegan potato salad is just, ah. Oh, so good. I actually may have to make some this week now um, that I love being able to take dishes like that and really 
um, add some really fun to it. I'm a big um, smoked paprika gal. Um, I love smoked flavors. And I think that comes from the tradition of like soul food and so forth that I grew up with, you know, um, where greens were flavored, you know, with that smoked kind of flavor and taste. And the idea that we have things like that, that within reach like smoked pep, that I can really incorporate that same flavors, that same flavor profile. I can still make that same mouth watering kind of feel is really what I love to do. And honestly, I enjoy kind of a traditional Thanksgiving or Thanksgiving um, event. To me, I believe in going all out. I am probably on the like maybe even ridiculous level when it comes to it um, because at times I've just had, you know, Thanksgiving with like my husband and my mother and I, so like three of us, but the table is full of dishes. Like I'm just making dish after dish after dish because it's almost like an expression for me. And I, I say that to say that to anyone else out there, like enjoy this journey for anyone who's on it like have a good time. Don't think about how many people or what the dish should be. Go for it as an adventure. And if you're celebrating your next holiday or anything like that, just have fun with it because I've found it's been great not only just taking classic kind of mealtime events and holidays and turning them upside down and making them vegan, but also throwing some crazy stuff into the mix and making people kind of stretch themselves and see things differently. So I really feel like when it comes to food, it's all about reconnecting it back to your culture, bringing in the flavor profile, the things that you grew up with, making those staples, and then having some fun and putting something um, on the play, on the table that um, gets gets people talking, gets people thinking about it. And even if we're in Zoom environment, um, my niece and I, we cook almost every week, um, almost every week, maybe every other week through Zoom and we cook together. You know, we just sit in our own kitchens and make things together. So even in this environment, I think you can, you know, veganize a classic in your family, I think is a great thing to do over Zoom and a great way to have some cultural discussions, a great way to even maybe try some cultural dishes um, yourself in your family um, that it might be kind of a fun thing to consider doing. And I'm finding it's, it's working well, keeping our family close during, during these times. Okay, and for myself, the whole thing is just like taking dishes that you loved went before you were vegan and veganizing them. So like lasagna, I was always a huge fan of lasagna. Vegan lasagna rocks. It's so much better. It's just, it's all of the pluses and none of the minuses. So there's just, you know, and then as far as meat goes, you know, there's seitan and there's so pea-based protein. There's, speaking of seitan, there's so many wonderful things, you know, uh, that you can do with seitan, you know, turkey, you can make you know, you can emulate bacon, you can emulate all kinds of flavor situations, but cruelty free. So like I said, just to elaborate on what was said before me, just veganizing things, not necessarily looking at going vegan as this whole new orientation, but instead veganizing things that you grew up loving, veganizing foods that you're familiar with, and then as well, going outside of that and experimenting with other, you know, food, food from other cultures, um, a lot, is, I find Indian food in particular lends itself well to vegan exploration. So for me, like I said, again, it feels just like, you know, everything was covered in front of me so wonderfully. So what I have to add is just, like I said, the veganization of things you already love. And, you know, just realizing that yeah, there's so many alternatives, even like five or 10 years ago, people might have had a little bit of a leg to stand on when they came to you and you said something and you were like, well, try non-vegan cheese. There weren't as many tasty alternatives five or 10 years ago. Now, everyone, Chow, Dea, everyone has stepped up their game. You know, there's really no excuse anymore to not go vegan. It's all the, flavor-wise, you can't say it's because of a lack of options now. That, that, you know, dog won't hunt anymore. So, like I just said again, just realize that anything you loved before, you could do a vegan version of it that'll kick its butt, <laughs> okay? And that's pretty much what I have to add. So we wanna pass it off now to uh, um, Tess to uh, uh, see if there are any uh, questions or anything else to, to bring up from the chat. 
Yeah, I didn't get any questions in the chat. I think you guys gave us a lot to think about. Um, uh, yeah, I didn't get any questions in the chat, but um, like you, like you all mentioned, such such important pieces of the vegan uh, community and being inclusive and connecting with everyone. Uh, we do offer some classes. Um, Stephanie, I love that you're cooking over Zoom with your family. I think that's really great. Um, it's it's a, it's an easy way to connect with others and. Uh, putting a vegan spin on it is only, you know, takes just only this much more effort. So being able to share those recipes and share your tricks and tips. Um, FIPS does offer culinary classes to um, do on Zoom, and we do have families come and take them together, which is nice. It's like a little cook off on my own computer here with people that I actually know. So that's a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, like like all these guys said, um, Gary was in a, in a good position as the last panelist. I'm in a good position as being able to hear all the panelists first before I had to say anything. So um, great job, and you guys really summed it all up. Um, if you guys do have any FIPS questions for us, Jess and I are here. I'll drop our emails in the chat box here if you need us. Um, but great, great job, everyone, and thank you so much. If anyone thinks of follow-up questions, um, please send them our way. Yeah, we just want to say thank you to Stephanie, Yvette, and Gary again. This has been truly wonderful. Um, we really appreciate your time, energy, and perspectives. Um, really, really do. And um, you know, we hope to continue in communication. And as PBS, um, we you know want to be continue to be reflective of of our of our practices too and our focus areas. So thank you all for the feedback. It's truly appreciated and meaningful. And we're we're taking literally taking notes and and taking it in. So really, really appreciate that a lot. Um, and also, um, Jess and Tess, thanks again so much for making it possible today. And, and Chris and Ellie, thank you, of course, as well. Um, and do we have some time for, um, if I'm um, Stephanie, um, Yvette, or Gary, any kind of further thoughts? Just kind of beyond the questions, just a moment or so. I, I and just if there's not, of course, that's okay to, yeah. Not a question. I just want to say this was a wonderful experience. I learned a lot today. and. It was just great being part of it. I know it sounds like, you know, just like blah, 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 but I really, you know, enjoyed being a part of this. This is a really wonderful thing you guys are doing. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Humbled and honored. Yeah, it was wonderful to be here. I love um, these types of events. I am curious from anyone out there, even if you have a question or even a comment, of anything that we talked about today, um, if anything inspired anyone to maybe do anything different. I'm curious if many of you are maybe thinking about your journeys either personally or you know, how do you take a lot of the things that you're learning today, how would you apply them? Um, I'd love you know, to hear if anybody does have any thoughts or if you drop in the, in the, in the chat. Um, I always love reading those things um, because I know sometimes these, these sessions um, can kind of awake an idea in you. So if somebody does want to share that, it'd be great to hear it as well as, you know, love to share it with, um, with me later on. Um, I think it's always fun um, to, you know, to, for all of us to enjoy this journey together. And I want to jump in really quickly, Stephanie, um, for any, I know a couple people are jumping off. For anybody, we have a ton of awesome resources in the chat box. You are able to save the chat. If you find the three little buttons on your chat box, click that and hit save. Um, so we can send out, I'll send out an email to everyone that kind of collects all these resources. But if you did want to save the chat, I want to make sure, um, I just learned that trick. So I'm very excited to share with everyone. Uh, so if you guys can find a uh, use from that, go ahead and save the chat too. I just wanted to say thank you as well. Um, and while everyone may be pondering some of um, Stephanie's questions, excellent questions to consider, just say thank you. And um, also to uh, remind everyone that, um, or inform in some cases that as you um, do begin a more inclusive spaces and diversifying your uh, vegan advocacy, that including um, people from different cultures and perspectives um, can and will be challenging at times, but um, there are books and articles and podcasts and you name it, um, all sort of talking about these things. So um, it's not to get overwhelmed and hear about, uh, for example, white veganism and feel like, um, you're necessarily being attacked or it's overwhelming to completely try and shift an ideology. 
Um, there are a lot of resources out there being created by um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, to sort of help understand where a lot of us are coming from. So um, hopefully everybody can look into those and keep an open mind and we can just build a more inclusive sort of safer space for all people to be heard. And we did have a great question come through in the chat. Um, Eva's asking, uh, she's wondering how she might talk with, talk with more family members about veganism. Um, I, I'll let the panelists answer, but I know just cooking them a delicious meal, that they have to ask you for the recipe and then you can hit them with the, it's vegan is always a good, uh, always a good option, but I'll let the pros tackle this one too. <laughs> Um, I have always tied, not always, <laughs> but I've learned um, it to be pretty effective to uh, start with things that you know that they care about. So there must be some human or social justice issues that they already have some knowledge of and at least theoretically feel like um, they could be passionate about or, or feel you know, like they, they want to do something about. And if you do your research ahead of time, you can always find out what the relationship is. Like Gary was saying, everything being intersectional, you can kind of always find the animal angle and throw that in to really like highlight how related it is. So it's not always this separate wild card issue that, that is already inclusive of, um, of your life and your, your worldview. Um, people I find just usually aren't aware. So like with the example with the pig farming, you know, um, you know, no one is sort of willingly hurting other people or thinking that they're hurting other people. They just think, I love bacon. But when you explain to them the relationship between bacon and hurting other people, then sort of a light bulb can sort of go off and, you know, you can go from there. They become a little bit more, um, you know, open and able to hear about animal issues when you explain um, that there's a connectedness, connectedness and it's not all, you know, animals only. So that would be my advice. Do you want to jump in, Gary? Anyone should have to go oh, last I, this time. Oh, okay. All right. I'm not, and I would just like to say um, that first idea that was expressed was the, always the one I find. Just so you want to avoid preconceptions. So it's just, I find it's best a lot of times just to invite them over for the meal. Don't even mention that it's vegan. You know, just make something that you know you love that is vegan. And then when they ask about it and as they inevitably will and say, this is incredible, then you say, well, this meal is vegan. And if you enjoyed it, you know, here's the recipe. Um, the reason I like to do it that way is because it like, it avoids preconception. Cause a lot of times when you mention the, the, the word vegan people put up these walls and they expect it to be, they always expect it to be bland. They expect it to be a chore to eat and all of these things. And none of which us vegans know is not true. We, you know, we know how delicious it is to be vegan, but in order to avoid preconception and in order to, you know, like I said, to not have any expectations, I just like to have people over, have a, a, a wonderful dish. And then like tacos, for instance, and use seitan for the, for the meat portion. That's a great example. Or like lasagna and just don't tell them that it's vegan. And then when they love it, you tell them that it's vegan. And a lot of times I think that's more effective than any talk that, you know, any kind of thing you can do to set them up with what you say. It's just best to let the food do the talking. And that's my input with that. The only small thing I would add to that um, is sometimes you don't always have to be the messenger. Um, when you're trying to, you know, help people understand or see things differently. We've been so fortunate to have so many documentaries that are out these days that sometimes just watching the documentary with somebody, watching some of these different films, it can create dialogue and discussion so that you don't have to be the authority and the expert in the room because sometimes that's a hard role and sometimes it's not always the best approach to be the, the one that's supposed to have all the answers. And I think sometimes when you use um, things like watching documentaries documentaries, maybe even reading an article and then having a discussion about it and also being willing to talk about what you've learned. Because I think sometimes when um, 
us as vegans kind of share what we know about veganism, we don't share the fact that we're still learning ourselves. We're still on this journey, we're still evolving. And I think it's important that when you have a discussion with someone and you're asking them to drive change or have a different perspective, that if anything has changed in you or your behavior has changed as well at, through your journey, you should share that with them so that you both have a of a vulnerable moment together, <laughs> as opposed to one person knows it all and the other person knows nothing, you know, it starts to have a much more of a collaborative discussion.